The sun is shining, the birds are chirping, and it's a beautiful summer day here in Podville. I'm just letting the breeze blow through my hair. Matisse Van Rossum. And I'm naked and afraid, Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as always, I am the uh, Midsummer King. It's true, he says it every time. Yeah, uh, this is yep. something we know about Ben. Yeah. He's the Midsummer yeah. King. Yeah, but it's good to be reminded. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm Ben Sheets. And joining us all the way from New York, New York, founding pod boy. He's back. He's you, walking here. Eugene Lundin. Yeah, hey, what's up? We're podcasting here. Look here, <laughs> what's this going on? We got mic stands and everything. Looks like we're talking about movies. Oh, I had to be here. I heard this was happening. I drove 10 hours, and I found them at the theater. And, oh, you did not we run away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we lived there, actually. Oh, oh yeah. that's what I thought. I was like, what's blankets and wet towels I looked, over here? I looked over halfway during the movie, and Eugene was sitting right next to me, and I said, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> you know that scene in Hereditary near the end? There's just that naked old man in the corner in the dark. That's yeah. basically that's what basically, I look like. <laughs> that's basically Eugene. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, it's hot down over here. Ooh, I was not ready. It's, uh, yeah, it's summer in full effect here in Durham, North Carolina, and today we're talking about Ari Aster's new horror spectacular, Midsommar, a film that I have been anticipating for a very long time. Same. And, uh, I will go ahead and say that I was not let down. Now, Eugene, this is actually your second time seeing this yes, movie. Yes, yeah, I, uh, I knew that you guys were gonna talk about it, so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna come prepared, so, you know, I watched it without you. And then I was going to surprise you. And, uh, you know, it gave me a whole different experience seeing it because my uh, opinions of the movie have actually changed pretty significantly between the first and second one. But uh, I'll get into more detail with that as we explain. Probably good to say that, like, you don't want to know anything about this movie going Oh, yeah, I would, go like, this, I would go into this movie as fresh as anything. possible, honestly. Yeah, so, I knew, like, maybe cults and that's it. Like, and I was... We're probably mm. going to get into spoilers pretty early on, so yeah. hard spoiler the warning less you know, from the here better. on out. Yeah, if you, if you want to see this movie, do it without listening to our opinions first, I think, and come back to this episode. You've been warned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess all I can say is if you like The Wicker Man or Hereditary or The Spookies... Uh, go see this movie. It uh, it's about a uh, a group of friends, a uh, a couple included, uh, who travel to Sweden uh, to experience a traditional midsummer uh, festival for like nine days or so um, on the uh, land belonging to uh, one of their friends' families. They sort of have this commune. Uh, this idyllic anarcho-primitivist commune out in the middle of nowhere in Sweden. Nice word. Um, nice word. Anar what was it again? Anarcho-primitivist. Anarcho-primitivist. They sort of start to try to take in the culture and tradition and uh, after a while discover that things are really not what they seem to be here no. uh, in this sort of idyllic uh, utopian village. You mentioned The Wicker Man, Ben. Uh, this movie is, I think, very heavily inspired. Oh, by absolutely! Um, it's it's a lot. It's very much about outsiders coming into a sort of uh, isolated pagan community, ultimately being consumed by the horrors that await them there. Yeah, and beyond the uh, like folk ritual connection between the two, like they really share kind of an immersive atmospheric absolutely. quality to them. We should we should qualify that we are talking about the original. 70s Wicker Man <laughs> and not the Nicolas Cage Wicker yeah, Man. And not the bees. Oh god, the bees, they're in my eyes. Not not the bees, Wicker Man. <laughs> uh, that, that is an important distinction to make because while that movie is very fun, immersive and uh, cerebral is something that it is not. No. One of the biggest things I wanted to talk about right off the bat was Hereditary was very focused on the blacks and the darks of the image yeah. in the movie. And this movie is the complete opposite of that. You know, it's all bright to the point of near overexposure. It's daylight horror. Technicolor, yeah. you know, super bright. And it really brings kind of a unique feel to the movie. 
in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's, because normally in a horror movie, you're looking for what's hiding in the shadows that's going to scare you. And in this movie, everything is in broad daylight. And I mean that literally and metaphorically as well. Like, this movie does not hide anything from you. Everything is extremely stark, including the violence and the gore. Uh, this is one of the gorier movies I've seen in a while. I, I'm actually surprised it was able to get an R rating with some of those yeah. shots yeah. that they had. Um, it gets very, very gruesome. Yeah, this, this movie is uh, sort of the antithesis to that idea of not showing something because your imagination makes it scarier. This one is like, no, we're going to show you everything. And it's also very scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really horrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really effective that way because a lot of the time you notice something uh, just because there's huge, wide, open field shots. So you see the characters also as the community is mingling around. Uh, around them and sometimes you you'll catch like a weird thing in the distance and you'll you'll just start to think about that and no no one's paying attention to it because there's just so much other stuff going on but it's a much like hereditary it's a very painterly film like every shot is not only just like beautifully composed and lit but also like there's a lot to take in in every shot and like there's definitely things that i think can get lost if you're not taking in all of it which is why i would like to see it again too just yes. because i want to i want to appreciate all of that but fortunately a lot of the shots are really long and or slow as well so it gives you that chance to kind of appreciate every every quadrant yeah um, sort of as a painting it. um I, on the ride home i was reading an article with uh the cinematographer and ari aster i'm not even gonna try pronouncing the uh, cinematographer's yeah, name was pavel something he's a, a polish cinematographer yeah i'm I gonna believe. butcher it if i try yeah. <laughs> so my apologies but uh they were talking about how they decided to shoot this digitally rather than 35 millimeter just because they had more room for a wide gamut of color yeah. in it and since color is so important they really pushed that um they were talking about how uh they were in super inspired by technicolor uh technicolor films that, like yeah. powell and pressburger stuff and stuff like that and it really shows because this movie was one of the most colorful movies I've seen. And and the, I the grading is so good. probably it's, since Mandy. And I, and yeah. I think I think incredible color grading. We should we should distinguish it from films like that too, because usually when you think of like colorful films in this day and age, you're thinking of like uh, like really saturated neons and stuff yeah. like that, i.e. Like, like Mandy and Spring Breakers and stuff like that. Yeah, a lot of very strong artificial, artificial lighting. lighting. Artificial, yeah. artificial yeah. lighting film, and artificial colors. And this film is all, the color all comes from like natural sources. Like everything is covered in flowers all the time. The sky is just like such a perfect crystal blue. The grass is so green. All the commune people are wearing like white gowns and stuff. It's uh, it's really, it's very beautiful. And to have such dark, uh, like horrific subject matter taking place in such like a beautiful, colorful setting is awesome. I love it. Well, the thing that I think works so well is that uh, Ari Aster and I think one of the other writers, they created that whole like, commune their religion all from scratch so they took inspiration you know obviously from other um i guess uh, Nordic, pagan like, and yeah, yeah and, pagan yeah. Uh, things like that but that we're basically you know seeing these characters coming into this but that for them all of it is just perfectly normal that right. it is well, it's all they've so. it's all they've known yeah like, they're, um, they're, they're kind of shocked when they're uh, like scared by it all they're like no this is this is what we do i mean yeah certainly for the beginning they, they have they, they have a very different conception of like life and death and they're not afraid of death because they they sort of believe in a kind of reincarnation cyclical nature of life so when you're dying you're just being recycled into a new form um so yeah like when the when the death really starts happening it's like just our outsiders who are like morbidly terrified by the whole thing for good reason i yes. think yeah absolutely um in that same article going off of what you said eugene like ari aster mentioned that they didn't see this movie as a horror movie they actually saw it, it as kind of a macabre fairy tale in a lot of ways 
Um, I remember does. early on yeah. before this movie came out, Ari Aster said something about this was like the Wizard of Oz for perverts. <laughs> That's interesting. I remember that you had said that, and I forgot about it until just now. And I, I honestly don't feel like that's an, an accurate description because I, I get the fairy tale, but I don't feel like this film is perverted. I think it's perverse. Like, it's not, like, not necessarily sexually perverse, but also, like... Just like well, just, there's a good it is a perversion. Of sexual like, imagery. There's some, there's some sexual. It's it is, it, it's, stuff, it's for people who like 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 the the horrific, the perverse. Yeah. Like like things that are you know perversions of nature, like that kind of. I think that's what that's, it means. Yeah. By yeah. That. yeah. And in that Most case, likely. I fully agree that's with it. That's me. Like, <laughs> it is it is a Wizard of Oz journey that takes you down a fucking like perverse rabbit hole. One thing that I want to uh, bring up, which we we haven't talked about yet, because it's sort of a, a another story that's going through all of this weird cult behaviors is that uh it's supposed to also be a breakup movie and uh, we haven't talked too much about the main character and what happens before they actually go off on their trip to sweden between her and her boyfriend christian mm -hmm. right uh that there's a lot of uh tension between them and it sort of like goes through the whole movie and i want to know if you felt those two things really worked well together, the the sort of relationship issues that she has, compared also in relation to the tragedy that happens to her in the beginning, and if it really makes if it makes a big impact on the rest I think, of the movie. That I think it in. actually I think it actually works extremely well. I was thinking about that because at the very beginning, our main character Danny, who is played by Florence. Pug. I, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce her. P U G H. Uh, the only thing I've seen her in is she plays Paige in the uh, in the WWE biopic that came out earlier this year. Oh that's yeah, that's was. right. Yeah. I was oh, looking really? at her IMDb and I couldn't find anything, yeah. and I was like, "Where have I seen this person no, she, before?" Yeah, she plays Paige uh, in Fighting with My Family. But uh, I thought she did great. But uh, at, at the at the beginning of the film, her sister, her uh, bipolar sister. Uh, essentially murder suicides her parents and uh, leaves Danny all alone and we already see that she suffers from anxiety we see her popping out of vans at the beginning of, of the film and there's a history of, of uh, uh, anxiety related mental illnesses in her family as well we, we have this immediate tension with her and her boyfriend because we keep seeing her boyfriend like talking to his friends like and be like dump her ass bro you're not happy you gotta get you some Swedish bitches man <laughs> um, think about all those Swedish bitches you could be in all those milkmaids all the milkmaids yeah, <laughs> um, yeah well, and that all comes mainly from one of their friends Mark played by Will Porter he's sort of the, he's, he's yeah. such a tool yeah, yeah. yeah right, he's, he, he's also he's the only one that's like smoking a he's vape. always vaping <laughs> Vape. Yeah, he's vaping like, all the time. Can I say too that like I've I've absolutely met him before, you oh, know, yeah. like and, oh, and the, like, it, they're yeah. they're very all the characters do a great job. I thought of of fitting like a sort of archetypical role, but it's one that you've seen in life, and they felt relatively realistically portrayed. Even when they said like dumb shit, it felt like dumb shit. I would see someone say, yeah, yeah. Well, it, I it, think the uh, all the actors like everything is uh, the they're all doing a really great job. Like they're really committing to who they're supposed to be. Yeah, a lot of those um, lines like I think yeah. have been delivered poorly. In, a, in right. a lot of ways, I feel like Mark is such a great comic relief in the movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know. He's he like, yeah, he's always like the first one, like when you have these really long sort of entrancing, like trippy sequences uh, that just like totally removes you from the real world and Im like immerses you in this uh, in this sort of culture that he's always the one to like drag drag it back down by like walking up with his fucking vape or something or like pissing on their sacred tree. Um, well, that brings up a, a <laughs> point that that I've been thinking about is all of the. Once once they leave uh, like our our culture and they, they, they enter this cult, all the grounding points that we have to associate with our own uh, our own culture, like while we're watching this film, are the negative things yeah, that these totally. characters bring with them. Like anything like we see of like our own culture that they, they pull into this place. It's it all feels really stuff fucking, of, it feels really out of place. Like like the their their breakup, their relationship like faltering is like the the grounding point. 
yeah for this film like and what a what a an unsettling like place to come back to to be to feel familiar it's great because like she because of what happens to her at the beginning like she's sort of like scrabbling for something solid in her life like somewhere where she can feel comfortable and feel like she belongs um and she's not getting it from her boyfriend at all which coupled with the fact that all of them are being heavily induced with psychedelics the entire movie it like really helps sort of pull her into the 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 commune culture and away from him like they do because like uh their friend who brings them their pella even says at one point when they're talking is like does he make you feel like home and their whole thing about this commune is that they're all they all address each other as like brothers and sisters that they're all one family and that they don't need the outside world because they have everything that they could possibly need together so the commune presents this idea of family and wholeness and home which is exactly what our protagonist does not have and that she wants so desperately so i think that as the setting for like essentially like you said a breakup story i think it's perfect and the fact that uh what i thought was a really clever touch is that her boyfriend's name is christian christian hughes christian views (laughs) (laughs) well yeah (laughs) um but like there's there's something to be said about her being like pulled away from christian into pagan not like she's ever portrayed as as like religiously christian but as sort of like a separation between the two cultures and like what she where she begins and what she becomes I thought assimilation that was... versus appropriation right. in totally some ways. Well, you the, know the... like some of the faults of the grad students and their demise is by not appreciating and you know paying attention right. to to their culture or blatantly doing things against it right what like, one of them is a well uh i guess him and christian are are both doctoral students and yeah he's the anthropologist and he's like doing his thesis on these people and midway through the film christian's like yeah i haven't figured out what i want to do my thesis on but i think i'm going to do it on uh on these people in their culture and so that creates a rift between them because it's like dude what the fuck this is my thing. yeah josh is just like come on man like i <laughs> this has been my thing it's been my passion and you're just gonna like piggyback and it's very clear it's what he's doing but i, right. what, I what i like what i like that i think is a subversion of that as well is Normally, like, the anthropologist character would be the one that is sort of, like, closest to the, uh, I'll I'll say, quote-unquote, alien culture here, because, like, he has studied it, he has the knowledge, but the problem with his character is that he cannot separate himself from that enough to actually immerse himself in the culture, he's continually observing it from like a anthropological standpoint so he's always taking notes and he's only thinking about it from from academic. a point of from an academic point of view rather than allowing himself to be immersed in the culture and so in that sense outside he, looking in he is almost more separated from it than everybody else where you would expect it to be the other way around yeah well, and whether it's intentional or not, you can sense that disconnect when Josh knows of the ceremony that they're going to perform when the elders of the uh, of the commune have reached like the the sort of like limit of their age. They they consider ages like seasons, and when you hit what was it ninety years Seven, old or seventy two seventy two, that you uh, that yeah they they ritually um, sacrifice themselves. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if it was clear enough, but he doesn't, like, he knows that Danny's gone through all this tragedy and he doesn't say anything right. about it. He doesn't he, warn, he doesn't warn them. He's asked it. about it, he just gives sort of a shit-eating grin, like, you'll see. <laughs> right, and then even the next day, like, when we're first presented with those two elder characters who are going to be the ones that sacrifice themselves, he even asks Pella, he's like, are those the two? It's so, like, he knows that all along, but he doesn't say anything to his friends because if you said, oh, yeah, tomorrow we're going to watch a ritual where a couple old people like ritually kill themselves in front of like the entire commune like they would have been like oh fuck no we're out of here and the fact that he like sort of lures them into that at that point it's 
sort of too late for them to leave. Like, that's sort of the turning point. That's the first time where they're like, holy shit, there's really something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, the film does a... I think it does an exquisite job of of setting up some of these dramatic events um, through, like, organic dialogue. Uh, One of my favorite sequences is when they're in the car driving up, they see several of these, um, several of, like, the Scandinavian girls, and they're, 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 you know, like, whistling at them or whatever from inside the car, being like, oh, man, they're they're really cute around here, aren't they? And uh, one of them says, yeah, it's because, like, all the Vikings just dragged all the the attractive people here. I I love how that that mirrors what happens with the cult later on. There's so... There's a lot of that in this There's film. There's so much really good foreshadowing like mm-hmm. a lot of the events it's that so happen in the movie. Well, like, the fucking... Except uh, for the bear, but that's great. <laughs> when they first get there, and one of them asks, like, oh, what are the kids doing? And he's like, oh, they're playing Skin the Fool. F- fool, yeah. And then that's what happens to to Mark is he gets killed and skinned and then when they take his body into the temple later he's wearing a jester hat with bells on it well uh, you know that's that's actually one of the things and it was an issue I had when I first watched it is that to me the foreshadowing it, it almost seems like they just tell you what's going to happen I didn't actually feel like that I mean you have that one moment where they have like this painting uh, set up on this cloth and it it shows what they call a love story and it laid out so clearly to me everything that well, was going to eventually happen that it doesn't happen at every moment and not all the stuff that happens but it was even moments like the skin the fool where I immediately in my head went oh well someone's going to you know someone the fool is going to get cut <laughs> that mark you know the vape smoking Fool, you know, he Boy might be the one it. that pisses ends up on the getting it. Tree, yeah. When it does happen, it's all executed really well, and I actually Literally. appreciated that. Right? <laughs> well, that's the thing is, like, a lot of it is once you've seen it, it's very clear. But I think that going in blind, it doesn't necessarily. Well, like, I mean, reveal like itself. you, the the, well, the painting, the, I mean, the painting with the really, girl, for instance, seducing, yeah, like that, that is really one of the, that, that is, was is about as laid out as, as sure. pictorially well, as I mean, it could be. Can, but I can, like that about it personally because you don't have it's any the, context for it yet. Like, yes, it's like the, oh, they make a big deal of showing it to you these sort of panels of this like love ritual or whatever but it doesn't really mean anything you know it's going to be significant because they they make the point of of panning across it but you don't have any context for it so when it start when they do execute it in in the film that i think like you said is done really well and that helps it's like oh okay that's what they were setting up before you recognize it but going in blind you don't have the context to really be like I know exactly what's going to happen here, you know? Right. No, well, I mean, like, knowing the context, like it was supposed to be a breakup movie of sorts, I thought it had something to do with Christian, but I certainly didn't know where it was going to go and no. how it was going to happen. Well, when I say the the like the execution of things, I mean more when um, you see these rituals perform. Like, the foreshadowing may not have really worked for me, but seeing it again like it because i was uh, i'll be honest i was i was sort of bored when i watched this the first time where oh, wow. i was waiting to see what the hook was and i actually knew people who did not like hereditary almost for that same reason where they weren't sold on the, the 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 family tragedy and then on the supernatural stuff at the end and i kind of felt like that too when i first saw it like i felt everything was so open and also openly creepy with this this cult like it wasn't going to go well for them i was left like expecting something more but seeing it again and seeing what they actually do because well there's during a lot of these these um these things that they're doing in the ceremony they consume a lot of like you know like drinks like whether it's alcohol or you know some of them are just straight up like psychedelics because yeah. then you see yeah they and, they get to the the as soon as they get to the commune for the first time immediately like they meet up with one of Pella's friends and they take mushrooms I really appreciated that that the film has like a a psychedelic experience you know like during that that first second act that isn't associated with the rituals yeah so they can kind of lay lay out like their um their visual formula for like what tripping looks like in that movie so when they trip later on like it's it's a nice reminder i love right so when it's less clear that they're ingesting mushrooms that you know that they are tripping and in a way because of that it gives them a an interesting out to 
you know, introduce some of the more absurd things in the movie yeah, without totally. making it feel absurd. For example, yeah. still based on uh, this reality, it's constantly daytime, yeah. you know, throughout the whole movie, and that's because the sun doesn't really set in this place. So yeah, like no one has it's, a yeah. It's so. far enough north that they only get a couple in the middle of the summer. They only get a couple of hours of darkness. Every yeah, night. yeah, but it creates the sense of not really knowing. Uh, it kind of dislocates it you fucks, in some it way. It fucks yeah. with your sense of time because even the characters a few times are like, "What day is it? Like, is it tomorrow?" And they're like, "Oh, well, from yesterday's perspective." So, like, okay, but is it or not? Uh, which I I think is great. Uh, we you know we get shots of them we get scenes of them sleeping quote unquote but it's because they they pull these big uh, blinds down over the windows of like the communal sleeping yeah. barn right which that also the the detail that they put into oh that like God. there's the all these incredible. these paint like yeah there's so much to absorb like you you all hear them talk about it right yeah. and um, Danny stares at them uh, at, at certain points in the movie, but that it's just the, it really feels like this this cult like exists and it has existed for years outside of. You Are you know, good, the, Cleveland? What's that face? Sorry, you, made? you were talking about the paintings. I was about to talk. Like I was about to agree that the the art's incredible, and I do, and it, it's yeah. amazing, and we'll we'll definitely get into that more. I just realized. So we just got back from this film. I just realized that that Danny has a painting of a bear over her her bed. Oh yeah. right, well you yeah, know, um, uh, art is. Sorry, all that just hit me, and that that freaked me out. That's that's great. What a great little. <laughs> right. the art is what a great touch. Place. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, even the the first shot of the film itself, it's this whole mural that, I mean, almost like it, it reminds you of like a like a um, uh, what's the like a Bosch painting or something like. Yeah. It has yeah. all the different seasons, and that uh, there's a lot to absorb. And thankfully, like it uh, it was good for me seeing it a second time. Like I. They're like pre Renaissance paintings, yeah. I, right. Well, that it also. So it details the the entire movie like that you see it from the beginning like it is in the winter and it that's when Danny's family right dies and, there's, and then it and goes there's a into skull the, in the sky in the place of the moon so it's like see, winter and death and yeah. that's the part of the reason why it didn't really bother me too much that it didn't surprise me in it's that like way they're, they're, you know like, they're they're, they're laying their cars like, right on the table right. and you know i i, I, I think too. it's a lot in the journey um i don't know about you guys but the murder suicide scene put such Fuck a sense up. of unease Fuck in me no, you're, you're, that man. it carried me into the beginning Dude, of the ari ari aster does like such a fucking good job handling like death and or per, rather portraying death and grief it's the same in hereditary i think yeah. like when when the daughter dies and like tony collette's reaction and like yeah that murder suicide scene it was and then just cutting to uh danny like in her apartment just like wailing just like the most tortured crying i've ever heard it's just like oh this is so it's so off-putting honestly i found myself very unsettled for most of the movie and uh in a good way like i know that that is intentional but especially with the introduction of psychedelics as well and allowing the film to sort of develop a more dreamlike logic because of that uh, I, I found that really, really immersive and that the events of the film take on this sort of psychedelic uh, absurdity that is just like such a bad trip, such a fucking bad trip. <laughs> and just like side note on the visuals, the film's presentation of hallucinating from mushroom consumption is maybe one of the yeah. most accurate uh interpretations that i've ever seen in a movie of of quote unquote psychedelic visuals also the the way the characters react to it as yeah. well like their portrayal especially like when they first take the mushrooms and the the one shitty oh, uh so funny uh, mark 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 is just like like oh y'all Y'all should try laying down. He's like, I'm gonna lie down. Lie down. Everybody lie Everybody down. Everybody lie down. Y'all need to lie down. Uh, yeah, and just like, Josh, try lying down. Just like staring up at the sky, just like breathing kind of hard. <laughs> uh, oh, and yeah, that, that playing back with her breath in that yeah, same moment. Which they use oh, multiple so times in and, the movie. And like the breath thing is it is pretty overdone. Like it's I'll be the first to say it, it can be a little overbaked in movies doing like the <sighs> You know, like to to amplify the fear and like that that closeness. I think and get a tactile it sensation. Work here it works really so well, well, and I put it oh. partially on the score working with it. Yeah, um, well, also design, because because yeah. oh, I definitely want to get into that in a second, mm -hmm. but also because the uh, 
part of like some of the rituals that they do require sharp inhalation and exhalations that they that they do all the time so there's like this very heavy focus on breath uh kind of like how uh, in the in the Suspiria remake it was sort of the same thing there was like this thematic uh importance of like sighing and breathing um cuz Suspiria means sighs but let, yeah, let's talk about music. Yeah, and sound. Um, the uh, soundtrack was done by Bobby Krillick, I think is how you pronounce it, also known as the Hacks and Cloak. Cloak. I found it really amazing. I like, it was it's dope. super dark ambient stuff. Um, but the thing that impressed me the most is the use of choral stuff. Yeah, uh, the voices, man. Um, incredible. Well, because like, it starts, like, the, the opening sequence after the traumatic event. Like you get that good old like hacks and cloak like like negative ambience like with like the the drawn out strings and like the heavy synths underneath, but after that like it's all like it's it's almost entirely choral and choral and, analog. and uh, yeah instrument instrumental with mm-hmm. the fiddles and drums and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, when they first go over to the camp, there's like three people on the flute. On it flutes, just, it's like something out of a they're picture book. Staged, or yeah. But, they're, but they're all but also all three of them are playing in uh, different tempos, so it it feels kind of off. Like a, uh, like a circus, like circus yeah. music or something. Well, I, I the music wanted... constantly like go like hedges off. Like it's so much of it is is in a major key, but we'll just like you'll hear like one flute or or something just like you know like like go down a half step. It, you know, and, like these un it, these perfectly timed like it was it was moments. really the perfect choice for a composer, and I I thought that as an added layer of sort of like oh man they made the right call is. It's the Haxen cloak, and the Swedish word Haxen means witch, and that's where the word hex comes from. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. got the Haxen cloak to do uh, the score for a movie about Swedish the, witches. So I, uh, it's perfect. Man, it's, it's so good. It's perfect. <laughs> I love the the use of diegetic sound though. Like oh, all of awesome. the all of the instruments being played, and even the chanting and the singing that they do and the color. adds so much to kind of the communal sense of yes. the the commune. Right. When well, even eating, the, like the, the, that, that really got me too. Like all the plates clinking like in succession. Like yeah. oh, when they, yeah, they ripple out from the human time. dominoes. Yeah. Yeah. And that fucking the scene towards the end where Danny's like having that panic attack and like all of the other like maidens come in with her and they all start like screaming in unison with her amplifying was, her a- yeah amplifying mm-hmm. like her her pain and and her fear uh i th- i found that really of like absurdly unsettling <laughs> like it's it would be easy to laugh at it if you weren't if you weren't like drawn into the movie in the right way, but I felt like I had been guided to that point. I was like, "Ooh, this is I hate this. Stop, please. <laughs> like, this is this makes me so uncomfortable." <laughs> there were so many moments in this movie. Like, I'm not easily unsettled, and a lot of this movie unsettled me. Yeah. Like in the in a similar way that like the Poughkeepsie tapes does, where I'm just like, "Oh, this I mm, like this makes me uncomfortable." The supreme one for me was during the mating sequence. Oh, yeah. when when like the, it's, <laughs> oh, it's, shit. it's amazing like because we all we all laughed at it but i feel like, like we laughed because we were uncomfortable absolutely like, that's why i was laughing I, I uh it's it's so rare that a that a horror film can can get away with that you know can like can make me laugh at it and still be very bothered well right laughing like, at it because you need to bring some kind of yeah. humor to it to not be super creeped out by yeah. it and, and, and that's how i felt i was like God. i have to laugh at this because i don't know what else to do and again like out of context it's hilarious yeah, like totally like the idea of like this old lady like like suddenly like like singing at you like while you're fu- the, it's very the craziest very part good. of the scene too is like at first, I think it is genuinely kind of funny, but as it continues longer and longer, it gets less and less funny. Yeah, I guess you know? it is. I, I don't know yeah. if I ever found it really genuinely funny just because you have so much of the buildup of him coming into that space and having like the elder with like the mask of like beads or whatever that was like hanging in front of his face. It's like, oh, uh, I know where this is going. <laughs> I don't know. And then to like open the doors and to have like the the girl he's going to mate with like laid out there and all of the other women like naked standing around them like swaying i was just like 
Yeah. I, I was uncomfortable. No, it from was the super get-go. creepy. Yeah. I will say the the shot where the the woman like caresses uh, his face up close was kind of funny. Oh, oh yeah, no, it, it was, was it, it was funny. Like yeah, I, yeah. I, I I laughed out like because like well she she caresses his face and like he's he's tripping balls and like he's in the middle of like fucking this person and like suddenly this lady just starts singing at him. Yeah, yeah. like like right at him like while it, it's. It's just so unexpected, and it, it definitely, like, I thought it was, I, I laughed, well, like, because like, it was comedic, when, but it settles over you. Yeah, I, I, and I, yeah I exactly. Like, I, I thought well, it was yeah, funny. It's, it's the duration was like, part of it, oh, too. Oh, wait, you know? you know, should I be laughing at this? Oh, God. And then you know, to have and, like, them cutting back and forth between that scene and Danny's panic attack in the barn, like, with all of these other women, and all just, like, screaming in time, and to, like, cut back between sort of the, like, the orgasmic sexual breathing and moaning with just like screaming oh my god that was yeah. so well, intense the super interesting part about that in context of danny's story is throughout the movie it's kind of the fear of being left alone yeah, in a lot totally of ways you know abandoned. yeah um you know with the family um she tried to email her sister to not you know do what she did right she has dreams later in the movie about being abandoned being uh left at the place and they're all deeply unsettling too because like so often that like playing back to the dead family can can be overdone and And here it's awesome at that point all of their other friends have gone missing and Mm -hmm. we as the audience know that they are dead at this point uh, but like, yeah, that, that moment where she like sees Christian in this, uh, horribly bizarre mating ritual, that's like the final breaking point where she has been like snapped completely free of everything familiar and comfortable that she knows and she's sort of just like set adrift. And it completely makes sense why after that she embraces the cult and allows herself to, to be the May queen that they want and that she offers Christian as sacrifice too. Do you love like how this film ends the exact same way as the witch does? And also hereditary. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's awesome. Yeah, well, because with Hereditary, I mean, maybe not as much, but that it's sort of about the alternate family, like with uh, Tony Collette's mother being a part of this coven where right. they're sort of trying to seek out the, the I guess, the approval of the of, uh, of King Payman. King Payman. Yeah, King Payman. And then with Danny losing her <clears throat> her real family and the only true, like, connection she has left is just sort of this dick boyfriend. I mean, I don't, right. he's kind of just, yeah, he, he's like, a dick. He's yeah, a dick. you, you don't dick. really know much about him. He never says much, but every time he he like, does did. anything. It's a yeah. super selfish. You know, yeah, he's so selfishly yeah. motivated. And you know from the beginning of the movie, because he says as much, that he has sort of wanted out of this relationship for a long time. So there's no sort of obscurity to his actions in the way that he behaves. It's not like, oh, is he being a dick because of such and such. It's like, you know he's not really committed to this relationship. Right. Like, he didn't intend for her to come. He offered to be polite, thinking that she would say no. But he should have known better because the last thing she wants is to be alone for a month and a half. So, of course, she's going to come along. Right. Well, like, he says that, like, I invited her. She said yes, but, but she's, she's not, not going to go. Yes. Yeah. It's like, well, no, she is dumbass. She has a, like, she has horrible abandonment issues. And, like, her parents and sister all just died horribly. And she has no one but you. You think she's going to let you gun, go fucking gallivanting off to Sweden for a month and a half and stay here in the winter, in the snow? Like, in uh, what we have already specified is the personification of death? No, of course not. He's, he's a He's a fucking dick. It's almost satisfying, you know, her sort of almost triumphant conclusion. Well, and the beauty of it that's is... That's what I think is interesting, because in a lot of ways, it is a macabre fairy tale. Totally. You know, I don't think, in a way, it's not a terribly bleak ending for her, her character. For her, for her, it's yeah, not. Yeah, for things her character. All, things all right well, for I'd her. say it's sort things of bleak. pretty badly for Well, yes, else. yes, yes. But we're talking about, like, her sure. progression she's, in the narrative. She is the like, protagonist. She is yeah. the protagonist. Well, I think that it's her, because it almost feels like she's 
corralled into this position by Pele that he is constantly trying to like edge at her to try and make her feel accepted and so that it, in a way it feels like as she moves from Christian to be able to detach from that that all she's done is lashed onto someone else this whole family and I mean with the inclusion a, of psychedelics she's extremely uh, uh, yes no she like, yes right she's she's very open to manipulation when so she, it's like she's certainly brainwashed by the end but I think that the film does enough with showing her relation to all of her other, like, yes, her you boyfriend see, and, and, and the, the friends and stuff. Oh, she doesn't that, have that much doesn't, else. That it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like, oh, she ended up here because she's brainwashed. It feels like that she ends up where she needs to be. And all we get for it, too, like, and, and it's all it should be is just a smile. At yeah. the end. You know, that that's all it needed to be. And I, I love that about it. Like, there's no, like, crazy act or anything apart from, like, her, I mean, just her choosing her boyfriend, you know, to be burned. But, right, but she doesn't actually participate in any of the violence. She just watches mm -hmm. uh, in that insane fucking uh, flower dress. I loved it. Thing. Yeah, with this oh. enormous, like, flower How crown. it became it's, burdensome. Yeah. Like, at the I end. Love, I love the, the scene where she's, like, she first gets crowned May Queen and, like, she sits down at the head of the table and like she's still tripping and like the flowers on her crown are like breathing well, like, and the food is closing. moving too and the like, food yeah. is yeah. moving yeah, like, that's, oh it's so cool the psychedelic visuals like it could almost like initially come off as just like some after effect that they put on the landscapes you know like near the characters but I think it, it works so well because of all of the long takes that come before it where you just absorb this landscape and it's because you see it's, what, it's, it's because, because that's mountains. what tripping looks like like well, that's but, what you see too well that rather than coming as just like some cheap effect when they do start to hallucinate right. that if, everything that you've seen for the past like two hours now you begin to see it bend and morph and you, you and it got it got you, to the you point just, you where you feel like the character where everything's just all it gets to the it gets to the point too where you kind of have a hard time separating the two like there were a few shots where like there's so much of like the psychedelic imagery of like things moving and breathing and stuff where then it would cut to like a still shot where it doesn't have any of that and i would still sort of like perceive it, thing yeah. like oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, exactly. it does it like I'm in like, that same like, oh, way shit. how lsd yeah. kind of comes and goes and it it, it uh it boomerangs you know and I, <laughs> right. I i really loved that speaking of which i do want to go back to the characters for a moment but uh before i do i was i was thinking about it during the film and Something that I, I particularly love that I, I think is very hard to do in, in filmmaking is the framing of this movie from the beginning is very stylized. Yeah, you get those, totally. those like those those up upside down shots of them driving on the road before any psychedelics so are involved yeah. or anything like the film has these crazy overhead shots like like of, of Danny moving through her house, like from like a roof perspective, like there's crazy drone shots and sequences uh, this film uh, and and the framing is always very picture book esque even with all of that like artificiality the realism of this film still comes through like i i still felt i was watching real people i still felt attached to them or like right. Uh, and that I was I was in an actual place. I never felt like I was like watching a Wes Anderson film or anything uh, like high as high fantasy. I and think that's such a hard line to walk. It comes down to the escalation in the yeah, movie. Totally. You know, we start in the States where it's very gray, kind of grounded. Right. And then the film has the seasons. Too. Yeah. And yeah. we go into Sweden and it's colorful. But as the film continues, and we get those psychedelic scenes, things get more and more pushed towards the exposure and the color to yeah. the extreme. And I think if they just put us in that from the beginning, it wouldn't work quite as well. well yeah, it but feels, since we're immersed... It feels like a peaking, like in a trip. Uh, you know, like there, it has that similar kind of psychedelic escalation. And you know the, the beautiful thing about it all, too, that I didn't even think about until we were driving home is that there's not a single supernatural thing in this movie. That's yeah, that's what I wanted to say as opposed to hereditary where the you know the final 15 minutes it's like yep there are real demons king paymon's coming to get his boys which, I, which in that movie i didn't mind <laughs> right but that with the midsummer you never have like you never have to have this suspension of disbelief like this is them appeasing any sort of actual spirit that manifests in this movie which is, which is what i thought it would be 
see and like, I, from the trailers i expect it to be like oh you know it it's like the wicker man they have a you know a pagan god that they have to sacrifice to for fertility and it's like well yeah that's what they believe but we don't actually see anything like that right which it, adds to just like how um one of the uh the volunteers he's given that like sap from the yew tree to not feel pain but he's screaming he's his ass off screaming. when he's yeah, burning exactly. so yeah. just like in the wicker man as the cop is stuck in that structure like you feel this sense of futility like is this right. actually worth anything and you know just like some senseless obsession with like reciprocity and yeah as they say. but i i love i love how it's like because of all of the psychedelic stuff and because of the escalation of events it feels supernatural just because it feels like more horrifying than anything could be and because everything is so steeped in ritual it feels like every bad thing that happens is linked to some sort of like supernatural uh intervention or sense of fate and destiny but there's none of that in this movie it's all just a, it's all just hallucination and right and, well, it, and inf like being influenced it's pushed by the psychedelics because that really i mean that is sort of like supernatural like when you do take totally. something like that like it's just I mean, so well, out of whack. I mean it's, it's it, cult 101 it's, like yeah the, it's it, how it's, cults work yeah, a lot it's, of times it's, it's so you know, real like at Manson and stuff like that and even, like, and even like in in ancient days and you know in shamans were just fucking tripping all the time like that's why they were the the holy men of the of the tribe is because they were just on a massive amount of drugs <laughs> and that they were interpreting that heightened state of mind as spirits or gods speaking to them or acting on them it's like yeah that's the whole it's a whole thing about religion is like being fucking off your ass stoned and tripping really helps make you like find the importance in everything well, you know it helps the divine create, importance in everything it creates an unclouded mind which is very important to this uh this cult because they uh <laughs> They have scripture, uh, these these runic letters, and then also uh, they're, they're painted on by their inbred sort of like bookkeeper. I yeah, guess. like I disabled know. inbred. Right, that their their whole focus is on keeping like, and that yeah, like I it got me thinking about like royal families too. Like they say keeping the bloodline well, pure. I, what, like, what I love about that is that in the scene before you have uh, Christian talking to one of the guys asking about them, is like, well, your community is pretty small. Like, how do you avoid inbreeding and they're like well yeah inbreeding is still very taboo we you know sometimes we have to bring in outside people right which that's another us. i but, feel like it's a little too heavy foreshadowing like you think at that point okay one of these guys well is gonna get sure bang. but then i'm oh, sorry no, but, yeah. then, but it also justifies like their previous openness well and it's also yeah, going well. into christian and the other girls kind of thing right you them, know? them sort of luring her in and you know adding you know, I mean, he's like a, he's a, a very good looking guy. So adding like those good genes to their to their community, you know, selected for mating. But my point with that was is in the very next scene. Then we have Josh talking to like another one of the elders and that elder makes it very clear that they specifically inbreed their oracles to uh, to, you know, make them mentally disabled. So they are. Uh, unclouded by uh, what? What is it that the, these uh, that they say he's unclouded by? He's unclouded by logic or something like that. Yeah, I forgot. It. Unclouded exactly. by judgment or or some shit like that. And those those oracles are the ones who like continue writing their scripture books. Um, or in this case, like finger painting books. Yeah, and I I love that too. Like, um, well, they finger paint, and then the elders interpret the finger yeah. paintings and write it as the scripture. So ultimately, so it still comes down to like they think that it's pure because of these uh, unclouded, you know, intellectually disabled kids, but it's still interpreted by regular old guys mm -hmm. so yeah and i, I love nice touch oh yeah and i uh i was like on the edge of my seat during that scene because like those books had like really nice vellum 
Like that was really good paper, y'all. I just, oh I just God. want you to know that. Like, uh, I didn't go to classical art school for nothing. All right. Like, uh, that's, that was some good fucking vellum, and I was jealous. And but that uh, kid got to finger paint. I know. Uh, I was like, oh man, I can do so much good art on those pages. Uh, it was really nice. It was really nice there's paper. Just, there's so much detail with that. Like, I mean, that kid shows up near the end as well as they're having their May Queen ceremony, and then also like the the sacrifice scene might be the highlight for me. Just also with like we talked about sound like I feel like it mixes so much with like the screams of the, the the London couple and then as it goes to silence from Danny's point of view and then just cutting between all oh, of that with yeah, like the whales in the movie, yeah, where you like them. hear a scream like way off in the distance and, right like it's just yeah. so so well done in those points and like when uh, also like with with the uh, el- elders killing themselves like you have them wipe their bloody hands on runes but on that cliff too beforehand like you see a whole bunch of other runes with those red streaks yeah. which mm-hmm. they put a lot of thought into this cult not just what they do but also how long they have existed and I, it I just do, gives them so yeah. much history i do appreciate that they like specifically created their own culture from scratch using like inspiration from other cultures for this one because i could very much see how if they just ripped another culture straight up and did this, it would be like, that's very demonizing of that culture. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Scandinavian stuff in there. Well, yeah, it's believable. Well, yeah. it's funny you say that because I, in one of the other articles I was reading um, right before we started the podcast, it was talking about how Swedish press and journalists and critics yeah. responded to the movie. And it was mostly just positive, yeah. you know. Um, well, but, Scandinavia these days is largely Protestant, yeah, or or just straight up secular. Yeah. So I feel like the people who are really who would be really offended by uh, demonizing pagan culture are pretty few and far. But between. one of the journalists, Varg there... Vikernes, for sure would hate this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one of the journalists in Go the ahead. article actually mentioned how ever since the movie came out. His office has been getting a lot more calls from global numbers about if this actually happens, <laughs> oh if, uh, God, you know, awesome. old people are ritually sacrificed. I believe the fuck out of that. Uh, so funny. Stuff like that. And I had found that hilarious, but it, you know, puts light on how authentic everything feels and how no, much of really, a good job yeah, they does. do. It's, it's honestly, like, uh, such a perfect set of criteria for, like, good world building, the way that they handle this movie, because it does feel believably real. Yeah, one of the only, like, uh, I'll, I'll keep it very short, but one of the only parallels I could find, like, culture was, like, for building, like, that kind of fantasy out of, like, like Scandinavian and, like, like Swedish sort of culture and, and whatnot uh, was, uh, is, like, The Witcher games like they they pull from that same kind of like you know grim so fairy heard. tale I've stuff i've never played and any of the witcher games or read the book yeah like the the tone was was pretty similar in a lot of contexts and uh yeah if you if you liked either of the two like you you would if you like one you'd like the other like i mean yeah I, I think the, i think the stuff is cool like i'm i'm interested in like that scandinavian culture stuff i feel like it's it's not you don't see a ton at least especially horror movies about it which I think it's always cool. I liked the ritual for that reason. Although the book is way better. Listen to our episode on the ritual. But yeah, I've, man, I thought this one like did that shit so perfectly. And I loved how they gave it to us from an outsider's perspective, but in a way that you felt like you were the outsider being immersed in it yeah. and that you make your own connection with it as you go along. That was fucking awesome. The ultimate sacrifice scene is is great too. Really reminded me of, of Hereditary. I feel like both films are very much about like an unwilling host being groomed as a vessel for, for something else. In Hereditary, it's literally as a vessel for another spirit. But in uh, Midsummer, it's as a, as a vessel for like a, a new personality. I think. Oh yeah, I want to go back in time and just tell the me who had just finished watching The Apostle that there was there is there was going to be oh, a man, movie yeah, that's I like this but actually Apostle good. Already. Apostle sucks. It sucks, especially now. Yeah, like, this is so much. This like, that man, so much this better. film is everything Apostle wanted to be. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. And, like I just I was I was so mad about that film, and I'm sure I think I even said it on the podcast too. It was like this. This film is like everything like aesthetically that I want 
and the payoff was just so garbage. And this film has such a good payoff by comparison. Yeah. I mean, literally everything about this film is... <laughs> I, I think that it was great to see, too, that Ari Aster didn't fall into a sophomore slump, and I think he's just... Yeah, gone. this wasn't mid-slumper. No. <laughs> No, uh, it's just gone so much farther to like enhance his very noticeable sense of style. Uh, he does like occult surrealism better than maybe anybody. Oh, that yeah. I, I play to his strengths. I, so I genuinely much. believe that if he has another one or two classics under his belt, he'll be in the same sentence as like Craven and Carpenter and stuff like Agreed. that. You know, his, him and Jordan Peele. I feel like people like that are are sort of becoming the the next class of of the the Cravens and Carpenters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, one I thing you're right. with with the Carpenter reference, I was very surprised when I searched up the budget of this movie was only six million dollars. Whoa, I, mean, yeah. I believe that. Like, that's dude. super Whoa. impressive, oh, though. Kid, but it. even as like a you know like a pretty decently big Hollywood production, like that you you know <laughs> movies can still rake up a huge because there's a lot there of there are so many props and everything too. Yeah, like well, there's so much on fun. top of that, like, it's dude, always stuff? shot outside yeah. during no, the day. Fuck yeah. me. They have a limited amount of time they can shoot it every day. Like, you know, Ari they Aster. can't do 15 hour shoots. He just well, seems like an where, incredibly where efficient they director. They shot it in Sweden, well, but it, no, I think it was shot in Hungary. Hungary, actually. yeah, Hungary. Yeah. Yeah. Shooting it all in, in that kind of daylight, too. Like, you can't, it, you know, if you schedule to shoot and the day is fucking overcast, that's scrapped for the whole, you know, that's a whole day lost. It is it is pretty impressive. Uh, I would. I wonder how big the crew was. We didn't stay through the entire credits, but I would bet they I would bet they shot with a surprisingly small crew. Shitload of extras though. Yeah. Uh, right. There's, there's, there's the, the so much going the commune, on. The commune is shot. probably like like fifty people. Like honestly, six million? That's what I read. Fuck me. Yeah. Like that's that's like, like that's off. like a that's like an it follows well no, it follows was two. less than that. Two million. It follows yeah. was two million. Um, yeah. but, but six million for like off, a, yeah. I mean, you know, like a wide release movie. Like that's that's very much on the low side for what you'd expect. Absolutely. Like, yeah. And but it's super impressive with all the extras because, you know, at a certain point with scheduling stuff like that with the daytime and all those extras. You, I would. There's. A, it's impossible to keep complete control over. I bet they. I bet they shot like that, all you know? of the scenes with the entire commune first. Guaranteed. Yeah. I would. I, I would reckon like the the commune sequences, like the outdoor sequences, they were almost certainly shot within like just a couple days, like where they had the full the full collective. But it must because it's you know, not like, just people walking they around the like they're no, it's yeah. very like, high. Like like they're cleaning sheets, they're dancing, same. like they're doing so, so many much things. Yeah. Heavily choreographed. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, impressive. They were all staged. Yeah, I well uh, planned. I was so impressed by all of that because really, it's like every time they go outside, there's never like an empty frame. There's always something going on in the background. People are always doing something. It's like those are people that have to be directed and stuff like that. That would. It would just be a nightmare, and they pulled it off so fucking seamlessly. Absolutely. The point I wanted to get back around to was characterization. I wanted to talk about about Danny a little bit more uh, and her her establishment at the beginning because we talked about how much of an asshole her boyfriend is, and I want to make it clear that this film doesn't make Danny likable simply because her boyfriend sucks. Like, they do a great job of building her up as, like, a really relatable and and liked character. I loved her argument scene with her boyfriend, uh, where she says, like, all the right things. She approaches that that whole conversation. And she's, she's like, under, like, an extreme amount of, like, stress. Yeah. And, 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 you know, they don't they don't have her, like, like break or, or anything else during that scene. She still, like, tries her best to approach it civilly. And her boyfriend is just so disregarding. And, well, and, that's, and, and she's always, she's always like trying to make excuses for him like in that scene she's like she's like no i'm not mad like i just wanted to talk about like about this like and then later when uh he forgets her birthday and pella says something she's like it's like oh no no it's not his fault like i forgot to remind him so like it's not on him it's like y'all been dating for four years he should know your fucking birthday, birthday yeah. yeah right and, and the fact that she's like willing to forgive it is like right oh, well man. It's, it's because it's like, because of her her fear of abandonment like yep. she's willing to look past his very glaring problems and put them on herself because she doesn't 
want to be without him. She didn't want to be alone. And, and what I like about that, too, is choosing that as a way to show it, like, doesn't make her character seem weak. Like, she's no. still making, like, a, a, a kind decision. And I, I love that. Like, that you can... You can have her character still be like so positively motivated. Whereas, like for instance, um, uh, what's her name in the the fly? Like when when she makes some of those decisions, like it's it's a little bit more reprehensible. Like and she's she sort of makes herself her own victim. But in this circumstance, like I don't see it that way. She doesn't make herself her own victim, and it's fucking rad. Also, that uh, she is mostly wearing like dumpy clothes. Like throughout the film was fucking yeah. rad. Hell yeah! Uh, this Sweat film doesn't. Queen. Yeah, like it doesn't have any of that male gazy bullshit. Yeah, or whatever. like she's a person, and I that shouldn't even be like uh, a thing I should be praising. Well, you know, but some it, of it, it is like, grief too. You know, yeah. like uh, being so grieving from her family. Yeah, that she just doesn't care. You know. That that's kind of what it said a little bit well, too. Think, yeah, like a lot of it was just well. like comfortable travel clothes. Well, you know, yes, yes, shit. travel yeah. clothes. Well, like, it's refreshing to see a movie that isn't trying to sell the sexuality of the main yes. actress. Because right. I watched uh, rewatched Split not too long ago, and oh, it's I, so full oh, of that. Yeah, at the end that's, when they whip out Anya Taylor Joy's tits. Well, yeah, but then also like it's making like all the the girls like strip down to their underwear and things, and yeah, like the camera constantly going down their boobs. It's like yeah, this doesn't feel. Right, like, yeah, even, the way we're like, feeling them is not the way they really should be. Yeah, and it's nice to see this. They're just the person. Yeah, and I feel like, like watching The Perfection, too, for the same reasons. Ooh, you yeah, know, like, like The Perfection rough. was so bad about that. Like, it just, like, it was all glitz and glamour, and, like, it's just, it's so refreshing to, to get that. It should just be the standard, but it's not. Yeah, I thought the costuming work in general was excellent. Spot on, man. You know, Spot on. I think each informed the characters in a really interesting way. There's a way. lot of, like, aside from, like, the uh, LSD, uh, or rather mushroom hallucination stuff, everything was practical, too. Yeah. Uh, which was great, especially horrifying when uh, Christian finds the London guy uh, blood-eagled. <laughs> That was, but still alive. Simon, yeah. That was, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in a, like, in a, in a very good way, but, like, in two, when they're, when they're gutting the bear at the end before they sew Christian up in it, like, that's a fucking prop. Like, they're pulling fake yeah. guts out of it. Like, ooh, it's... Oh, I love that. And you see so much. I love how they they sew him up in the bear and then set the uh, the temple on fire. And the scene earlier when he goes to the lady's house because she wants to talk with him about like mating with the the girl who likes him. He's sitting in that like waiting room and he's like staring at the, a painting of like a bear with like fire coming yeah. out of its chest. Yeah. I thought that was great. Another one of those instances of like visual foreshadowing. Yeah, and it, it's fun. I loved it because this genre has very specifically been done before with Wicker Man and like, you know, Apostle and it's so many a, others. It's been like, a while, like yeah. Tribal ritual well, films Apostle, or in, in you know, like cult films are, are, are relatively common. Well, and like this yeah. this movie like it doesn't play it up from a self aware perspective and it doesn't have to. And I love that. But it it recognizes that you know where it's going. Yeah. You know that things are gonna go bad. You don't know how and what way. And so you are there for the ride. And I think in that sense too, like it, we can come back to like the Wizard of Oz thing we were saying earlier. Like you are on a ride, like for this movie, and it's a very good one. And or like, very or very you bad. know it's uh, <laughs> true. It's you know uh, all my wires are getting crossed doing the, all the horror it's the stuff. Fear. It's like, oh, that violence is so good. I'm like, the, oh, hold on. <laughs> like, it's the fear of the unknown culture, really. And yeah. you know, I in a lot of ways this movie reminds me of Cannibal Holocaust. It's anthropologists in a lot of ways exploring an unknown culture and yeah. it's it's deeply unsettling and i think uh wizard of oz is a great comparison especially with the the technicolor use and the fact that it is really about danny's journey yeah, totally. across the uh the narrative i love that i have to ask this were the the elders that killed themselves were they in the pies I was gonna ask the same thing. Were the meat pies? That's a theory and that I, I was. I love that I have to ask. Playing around right? in my no, head. dude. I think that's. I think that's a red herring, and I because we see the elders remember put on uh, that fire out in the yard, and then later we see the ashes being taken away and disposed of. 
So they weren't like cooked. They were. Yeah, no, I remember them dumping the ashes. When do they show? Do they show dumping the ashes after the pies? No. Oh. I think that the 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 meat pies is a good red herring that I'm glad that it turned out to just be a red herring. Right, it was just because a puke was, in the pie. It wasn't like it was, a tooth or anything. Right. Well, because they set that they set that up like, oh, we're making meat pies, and at that point, like the uh, Sweeney Todd theme starts playing. The well, the uh, <laughs> couple from London had gone missing at that point, and they're talking about, oh, we're making meat pies and stuff like oh, that, and right. they kind of like make a big deal, like showing the meat pies. And it's like, oh, shit. So they're eating the people, too. And that was a point where I started to be like, oh, no. Honestly, like, cannibalism does not fit for me in this culture with everything I'd seen. It's like, that doesn't feel right. And then it's like, when they were eating, I'm like, there, someone's going to find something in the meat pie. And then, like, he pulled the pubic hair out. And I was like, what the... At first, I was like, oh, it is it is humans because there's, yeah. there's, oh, I there's the hair in there. Like, because they and had then, that earlier, yeah. And then later, they mentioned, like, oh, yeah, it was, like, the, the painting. Like, we see the, the painting of... Well, not only that... pubic hair and putting it in the food. But also, the her her blood was in his cup. Yeah, that's right. Um, his cup was just a little bit darker, uh, red. It was just red-tinted. Right. Because yeah. that's, that's in the, the, the so at, and then at the end when they do the sacrifice they bring in the bodies of those that they had already killed and we see the bodies of the the couple from London and they were whole the meat pies I don't think they ate anybody I I don't think that was a thing I, think I don't think was, so either I and was, I, I, I hope think that was so and I like that I think that was a red hair right? Mark and the other character that during that sequence they had in the back I can't remember who else was on it but they showed. Him in the jester hat, and he was gutted on the inside. Right, so they, I, skinned, they skinned him. But he, they also removed what was inside of him. They showed that clearly there. Yeah, I mean, I guess they could have been eating him. I, I like that it's somewhat ambiguous. Like, it mostly plays as a red herring. I but think they I, don't. I think that they if, don't ever explain it enough to leave you with a sense of an ease for well, it. What I would like about that is if if that is the case, if it is still left open. I would like to think that probably the majority of the people but there. But Mark is Mark is still alive when they eat the meat pies. Oh, that's true. He that's gets true. up. That's it's during that that dining yeah. scene where the girl comes over to him and says, "You come with me. I show you." And he's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go with her." She shows me, <laughs> and that that's when they're eating the meat pies. So Mark is still alive then. So I. But the the idea that they use the bodies in some way is oh, they can still like dump open, the ashes you know? and still like have eaten them. Right. I mean, they're sitting. They're sitting outside, being burned to ashes. I feel like we would have. Somebody would have noticed if they had been like True, carving yeah. off pieces of meat and like carrying them into the kitchen. Yeah. Not like, with that. and if you're gonna cook, if you're gonna like cook meat from an animal, you're not just gonna throw the carcass on a fire. Like you're going to pull the guts out and you're going to clean it and stuff first, and then cook it because guts are not good to eat. I'm into that. Uh, so I I think that most of the evidence points to that they were not eating people. I guess there's still a little bit of ambiguity over for can you, Yeah, can you explain the uh, Josh's foot from the ground? Oh, I didn't like that. That's, uh, the, I think, probably the one thing. I they, uh, like. I, that was obviously part of some, some ritual because we... Yeah. But I mean, they when they they dig him up at the end and put him in the in yeah. the in the temple because we see that he's covered in dirt. So I guess burying him in the garden, like it's a fucking fertility. Well, call. they do the thing with that's the meat. True. They, you know, yeah, they so do the, they do the, that, they, do the they do the thing where they have Danny like bless the the like meat and grain food for and the, earth. the food for the earth yeah. that they put in the ground and bury. So like and and when they when we have his legs sticking up out of the ground, there's a rune drawn on the sole of his foot. I was fully comfortable with that just being like, oh, it's just some part of the some part of the ritual. And then, you know, at the end, they dig him up and burn him as a sacrifice in the temple with the rest of the. Well, the that's of part them. of what I like, too, is like they don't always fully explain some of the ritual stuff because we are still an outsider looking. Right. In, and I think that's and the, we're not meant to understand. all. I think of we it. just we, I think we get just the right. Amount and of that's why I think yeah. having just slightly open ended things sure. like that work so well. I, and it, it kind of even takes stuff that are less unclear and make them more muddled because we're so immersed through the eyes of these outside characters looking yeah. in. It's, um, that's true. There's I, I, I appreciate that they don't explain everything. Like, it's 
it's just the right amount of exposition. There's a lot of stuff that's left unclear, but you can formulate your own ideas just based on co the context in which you see it. Uh, that's, that's why I was talking about earlier, just like world building 101 in this movie. Like it's so good. Make it feel like a place that has existed before these characters show up, showed up there. And they did a great job of that, that like everything that happens in the movie, isn't just a performance for the protagonists that this is them being thrown into, uh, into unfamiliar waters. Yeah. Uh, I think we're ready to rate, unless anybody else has anything. Eugene, are you good? No, no, I'm ready to rate this. All right, uh, I guess I'll start. This movie exceeded all of my expectations. Uh, I think I liked it better than Hereditary, and Hereditary was already a very high bar. I love that this is the uh, second sophomore film that we've gotten from an extremely talented director this year. We've already had Us from Jordan Peele and now this from Ari Aster. I'm just more excited than ever to see like where these people's films are going to go. Honestly, I think think this is my favorite film of the year so far i think it's i think i actually like it a little bit better than us um it's gonna be it's gonna be a five out of five for me there is no such thing as a perfect film but this film is perfect for me five out of five and yeah. i i think i i think i agree i'm gonna have to think about it because us is very, very us is good. great no but, it's, a, it's a super high bar and yeah that's a that's a tough choice for me but i I was walking into the film thinking the same thing, like asking myself, like, have I seen a better movie this year? Yeah, I was really floored by this movie. It was one of the most immersive theater experiences I've had in a while. I think um, since Climax. Yeah, probably since Climax. Uh, it's incredibly disturbing and intense, but at the same time, it's also one of the most visually striking and colorful movies I've seen probably since mandy and in terms of natural color make uh, more daylight horror That's yeah 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 it, it's kind of the gold standard for that i can't think of any horror daylight horror like that that's done as technicolor and well yeah you i know? mean the closest thing i can think um, of is the original wicker man but even that not. isn't like true like technicolor no, type of pressburger yeah. powell's type of stuff i thought the soundtrack was amazing all of the storylines were really tight and while there wasn't a true element of surprise always like things were heavily foreshadowed i think it works well with stuff like the daylight because it's about the journey and you know not realizing what's going to happen next rather than not knowing what's in the dark and i think that's a great transition from hereditary to midsummer well, so i think this is one of the best movies of the year yeah absolutely this is a five out of five for me no doubt all right eugene bring us home well, I'm sorry to bring it down a little bit, but seeing it a second time, I thought that I was going to feel just as sort of like placid about it as I did first viewing it. But there's a lot more that I enjoyed and appreciated from seeing it a second time in terms of visuals and just as like a a more uh, mental horror adventure than with Hereditary and its more supernatural elements. Uh, I think I still like Hereditary a little more just because uh, I find the family drama so much more gripping. Um, the characters, uh, acting wise, everyone did a really great job, but just did not pull me in the same way as I thought uh, Tony Collette and uh, all the other actors did in that movie. So I, I'm still I'm giving it a four out of five. But yeah, it did not uh, hit the same heights as I thought Hereditary did. But as um, a director to look out for, I. I'm very excited for anything else that Ari Aster will make in the future. All right, that's a 4.8 out of 5 for Midsommar. If for some reason you didn't take our spoiler warning and you listened all the way through this, uh, go see it, I guess. I mean, like, there's such not... an el element of spectacle with the color that, yeah. like, yeah. It, it's even, worth seeing in the theater. You could, like, I'm sure it, you could even enjoy it if you knew a lot of the things that did happen. Oh, I yeah, mean, of it, course, it's better any... not knowing yes. going in, but it's a great film. Like, I want to watch it again just yeah. for the, the visuals, totally. much, much like no, how it's... I felt about, like, The Witch. When I first saw it, I was like, "Oh, this is not the first. Like, this is not the last time I watched this movie." It's for sure in the same league as The Witch for me, mm -hmm. uh, it, and yeah. like it follows. I, I liked it more than there. Hereditary. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it was. I, I thought it was incredible. Um, and now, on that note, I think it's time to go to a place that we have not been in a long time. You freaking bricks!
What time is it? Metacritic Corner. What time is it? Metacritic Corner. All right, I have two brief Metacritic reviews uh, this week of Midsommar. It's a very polarizing film. Largely well-received, but there's some people that didn't like it. And I have two of those from opposite ends of the spectrum. This one is from Metacritic huh. user Chewy Louie. Hmm. <laughs> Another film bashing traditional European pagan culture and heritage. <laughs> also, the theme of codependency is so overplayed in modern culture, where we are told to be hyper-atomized individuals, never explores the positive of our natural need for reliance on our loved ones or community, zero out of ten. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, Hold whoa, up. whoa. Hold the fuck up, Mr. Chewy Louie, all right? Like, here's <laughs> here's my thought on that. Like, you're going to see a horror movie. Do I, what, what are you looking for positive? Like, like what the fuck? All right. Also, but like, I think that there's still a an absolutely an overarching positive yeah. message of community. Like, a lot of horrifying things happen in this movie, but the community is very tight and they all seem very happy and Danny finds a place of acceptance at the end of it. Like, I don't think that, that that this movie is at all trying to uh, push an agenda of being a hyper-atomized individual. Nope. If any, like, her boyfriend is a shitty person. That codependency that she has on him is a bad thing. And also, like, he is the kind of, like, shitty person that you date for four years. Yeah, totally. Like, it's so believable. Like, your relationship is just... Man, I've seen it. Like and she broke up with him in the most metal of ways by sewing him into a bear right. and setting him on fire. <laughs> uh, all right, <laughs> moving on. This one is from user Peacocks sixty five. Well, definitely two hours of our lives that we will never get back. Most bizarre movie we have ever saw in our lives. <laughs> My husband said that I will never, ever, ever get to pick out a movie again. <laughs> we literally left Whoa. as we were walking out, shaking our heads and asking ourselves, what in the hell did we just watch? Bloody, gory, disturbing, don't waste your time unless you are truly disturbed. Zero out of ten. Uh, excellent. That's I'm a- trying to get down with the sickness. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, I just, 100. That's a kind of- I am truly disturbed. I'm just imagining like an old uh, suburban couple just going into this movie not knowing oh, what yeah. it is. And then walking out and the husband being like, you're never picking a movie again, you bitch. This is what I get for letting you pick out the movie we go watch. Oh, it's excellent. I want to give two shout outs, by the way. First, uh, there was a couple that did walk out during our screening. Oh, God, yeah, that's yep, right. About halfway Which, through. Yeah, they, it was they, already yeah. an almost empty theater. It was the four of us and uh, two people sitting a, a few rows below Which, us. They looked like they were having a very good time. So yeah, yeah they laughed at the at the same times that we did. So. <laughs> yeah. But the couple sitting behind us did get up and leave. Yeah, badge of honor for the movie. And then I also want to mention, if you do see this in the theaters. Hopefully, oh it God. has some acoustic separation. <laughs> oh, fuck me. Because I'll Rocket Man yeah, was playing like next door to us. And in some of the quiet <laughs> moments of this movie, really we just hard. heard Elton so John mad. being blasted <laughs> through the walls. Like, seriously, that is the second time we've we've gone to AMC and, like, there's been bullshit. And it's yeah, just like, I'm so done with that yeah, theater, dude. man. That, like, this is like, a different one. Yeah, this we went to the AMC. other AMC. This is not the same theater where they were doing construction. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Those are two different AMCs? Yeah. Yeah. But they're both AMCs? Yeah. Fuck me. All right. <laughs> also, there's a, also, there's a hole in the screen. There, I did notice the hole in the screen. It didn't bother right. me too much, but like in all, in like the really, no, the film is so good. I, I just I did everything I could in, to in block like it out. in like the really quiet, sinister moments, and then like through the walls. It's really obnoxious. Just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, 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 what the fuck is happening? <laughs> yeah, it was some hot bullshit. I mean, that's that's no, that's really nobody's fault because like. 
it's a quiet movie. You're gonna hear the movie in the next theater. Like that's not the theater's fault. It's just an unfortunate side effect of going to see a largely very quiet movie in the theater next to a fucking musical biopic next to, next to Elton John. <laughs> All right, well, before we sign out, I think it's time for a word from our sponsor. Isn't that right, Cleveland? Yeah. Hello. Uh, this this week's sponsor is brought to you by uh, Anderson Andersonson's Bearskin uh, Footy Pajamas. <laughs> Ooh. Are you tired of having uh, a bad footy pajamas? <laughs> Not anymore. Uh, I'm gonna drop the accent now, halfway through the ad. Uh, not anymore with uh, Anderson and Andersonson's uh, bear footy pajamas. You can you can wear a bear, and why not? Do I have to? Why be, be bear when you can be bear? I'm I'm looking at the copy here, and it says that they do want us to um, clarify that you do have to be stitched into the bear footy pajamas. Required. So once you're in the bare footy pajamas, it's gonna be hard for you to get out, if not impossible. But why would you? And, and Anderson and Anderson said. Right, and it's easy because it comes with simple IKEA esque instructions. <laughs> bear feuds. <laughs> bear feuds. <laughs> Anderson and Anderson sons. Bear feuds. Feuty pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, that'll bring us to the end of this week's episode. Do we know what we're doing next week yet? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, it's a surprise. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Uh, we didn't think much past this week because we were too excited for that. So uh, tune, tune back in next week for a surprise. If you like the show... And we hope you do leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash podpeoplepod. Also on Letterboxd at letterboxd.com slash podpeoplepod. For the complete list of all the films we've talked about on the show, with our ratings and links to those reviews, follow me on Twitter at <laughs> Mr. Van Awesome. Maybe I'm trying to become like a Twitter guy, um, and you know it's going pretty well so far. I have uh, about an average of two likes per tweet. Oh, you some know? big numbers! So I'm I'm pushing big numbers. Some numbers on hey, the board. Big numbers. <laughs> got numbers on the board. Uh, you uh, can follow me at Mr. Sheets on Twitter. Trying to tweet sometimes when I feel like it. I tweet a lot at like 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning. So that manic energy really gets going. Honestly. I also tweet a lot at 1 in the morning. You can follow me uh, tweeting for uh, Light Arc Studio. Also, uh, uh, you can find my art to work. All my spooky, if you like spooky psychedelic stuff. Uh, you can see more of that on my art station as well, and primarily by playing It Stares Back. It's on Steam, baby! Get it? It's for, good! For a cool six American dollars right now, so mm. get it while it's hot. Yep, but it's going up as we add shit, because yeah. we're right, we got some <laughs> shit planned. Oh boy. Steam, It Stares Back, six dollars. Pick it up. Yes, sir. Um, Eugene, what you got? You got anything? Oh uh, no, no, I got nothing. I'm off the grid right now. You know, nice. if you happen to be going by Smoky National Park in the next uh, couple days, if you see a man in a gi with a giant knife and a chicken mask with a camo cowboy hat, well, just you know, pop by, say hi. So that's all I got. <laughs> all right. Nice. Well, thanks as always for listening, and until next time, don't fall down dancing around the maple. <laughs> <laughs>